I'm Lizzie Hungerford. And I'm Aaron Stroh, and we're presenting about neurofibromas. Neurofibromas are benign tumors of the peripheral nervous system caused by the disorderly proliferation of Schwann cells. They appear clinically as either solitary or multiple lesions. Although the cause of solitary lesions is unknown, multiple lesions present as part of neurofibromatosis type 1, an inherited autosomal dominant condition. Neurofibromas may be asymptomatic. If a neurofibroma is small, it is easy to go unnoticed by the patient. The patient may also be unhappy with the aesthetics if both if multiple neurofibromas on the face are present or if they have a facial asymmetry caused by large, deep neurofibromas. A patient may complain of pain or numbness if a neurofibroma involves a mandibular nerve. Neurofibromas may present as deep, diffuse masses firm to palpation. They may also present as superficial nodules. When seen in conjunction with neurofibromatosis type 1, they can be found in association with cafe au lait macules, bone abnormalities, or central nervous system changes. They may not be able to be seen clinically as masses may lie on nerves within bone and can only be detected radiographically. The solitary tumors previously discussed present most frequently in young adults but can occur at any age and are slow growing. Neurofibromatosis, one of the most common hereditary conditions, occurs in one out of every 3,000 births. And oral neurofibromas are seen in as many as 25% of those patients with neurofibromatosis. Additionally, of these patients, there is a 5-15% to 15 chance of the neurofibromas developing into malignant nerve sheath tumors. The neurofibromas resulting from neurofibromatosis type 1 have variable expression ranging from a few neurofibromas to hundreds or thousands. Two-thirds of cases have a relatively mild disease. Neurofibromas can be described using the following acronym. L. Location. Generalized, unilateral or bilateral, commonly affects the facial bones such as the maxilla, the mandibular body, the ramus, and the condyles. Most commonly, a widened mandibular foramen is seen. E. Edge. Ill-defined, sometimes well-defined, especially within the mandibular canal. Other times, it may mimic other diseases radiographically and lack well-defined edges. S. Shape. No defined shape. I. Internal structures. Typically, the lesion itself is radiolucent and usually unilocular, but it can be multilocular on occasion. Changes in normal radiopaque anatomy can be seen, such as defects in the mandibular condyle. O. Other. Often, teeth are displaced on the side affected, resulting in malocclusion. Sometimes teeth do not erupt into the occlusal plane. Cortical bone is sometimes thin or appears to have a defect in it, both on the ramus and near the mandibular canal. The mandibular canal may also be enlarged. N. Number. Depends on the type of neurofibromatosis, but can present as a single lesion or multiple lesions. S. Size. Ranges from small areas of the mandibular canal affected to large lesions that affect the oral and maxillofacial area. Differentiating neurofibromas from other neurological lesions may not be possible radiographically. However, it can be successfully differentiated from vascular lesions due to the expansion of the inferior alveolar nerve canal with neurofibromas in a fusiform shape whereas vascular lesions affecting the inferior alveolar nerve canal often alter the path of the canal in addition to enlarging the entire canal itself. Typically, the disease, as previously mentioned, is associated with neurofibromatosis. This means that the disease has multiple ma manifestations intraorally and cutaneously. The presence of cafe au lait spots, axillary freckling, also known as crow's sign, and iris freckling, also known as Lisch spots, are considered diagnostic of the disease. Bone changes are seen in more than half of the patients with neurofibromatosis and typically affect the mandibular nerve and canal. This results in anything ranging from cortical erosion due to soft tissue tumors or medullary resorption from intraosseous lesions. This may result in pain or paresthesia of the mandibular nerve and other nerves. 
Radiographically, mandibular involvement may be visualized by the formation of a flaring inferior alveolar nerve foramen, giving it a so-called blunderbuss appearance. Hyperplastic and hypoplastic changes in the condyle may also indicate neurofibromatosis. There is also a further differentiation which results in different radiographic appearances. However, this is determined histologically and is determined and is termed a plexiform neurofibroma due to a differing collagen matrix. The plexiform neurofibroma is pathognomonic for neurofibromatosis type 1. Granular cell tumors are similar in appearance clinically and due to a similar etiology of Schwann cells, they must be included in the differential. However, these are more commonly found on the tongue as opposed to the mandibular canal. Lipomas can also look similar both radiographically and clinically to neurofibromas. However, these can be ruled out histologically due to the presence of adipocytes. Solitary neurofibromas have been treated by surgical excision with little or no recurrence. Multiple lesions can also be treated surgically. However, depending on the number or extent of the lesions, this may not be a desirable or practical treatment for the patient. Additionally, if a lesion is excised, it is advised to periodically evaluate the area because, as previously stated, these tumors are capable of undergoing malignant change. Recently, advancements in late technology have resulted in the successful removal of small cutaneous neurofibromas without surgical intervention. Due to the possibility of inducing malignant transformations of these tumors, radiation therapy and chemotherapy are typically avoided. In the event a plexiform neurofibroma transforms into a malignant form, chemotherapy and radiation therapy are options considered only after surgical resection. Because of the variable presentation of neurofibromas, there are many types of specialists that should be considered when thinking of referring out the case. For cutaneous lesions, a referral to a plastic surgeon would be advised. A surgeon in general should be referred to for the surgery in order to safely excise the tumors, but in addition, a plastic surgeon would be more favorable in any superficial surgery of the head and neck. This is even more important when dealing with the multiple lesions affiliated with neurofibromatosis type 1 to try and keep the patient as happy aesthetically as possible. For more involved lesions affecting either the optic or vestibular cochlear nerve, an ophthalmologist or oral laryngologist should be respectively considered due to the possibility of audio or visual impairment. Both specialists would be more qualified to handle this type of surgery and increase the chance of success as opposed to referring to a general surgeon. If any neurological symptoms appear, surgical intervention should take place as soon as possible in order to maximize the success of the surgery. So here are some takeaway points. Number one, neurofibromas present clinically in a wide variety of ways, but will most commonly be seen as small, superficial nodules or large, firm masses. Patients may be asymptomatic or they may complain of pain or paresthesia, depending entirely on the nature of the lesion. Number two, the best treatment option for both solitary and multiple neurofibromas at this point in time is surgical excision. Research has gone into exploring other means, such as laser removal, but surgical excision is still the go-to method. Lastly, number three. As would be expected based on the clinical variability of these lesions, there is also a radiographic variability. Lesions in the bone are radiolucent and range from well-defined, sometimes even corticated edges, to ill-defined edges resembling a malignancy.